So hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah. So until yesterday's class, we were discussing. Uh, we just introduced perceptron. We started with the McLuhan Pitts neuron model, and how McLuhan Pitts originally thought that brain is like a a big logic machine, like a big Boolean circuit, and uh, so it has to be programmed. So then we said, how if you look at other uh, basic data about the brain, that kind of a view of brain is not tenable. So it has to be more uh, something that is a, that learns by itself, right? Uh, so so that is how perceptron came about, and uh, we just quickly introduce the learning algorithm, which was something like this. So W is the weight vector and B is the bias. So if X is an input pattern, uh, it could belong to two classes, C1 or C2. And so, th so that is denoted by the desired output, by varying the desired output to, I think, uh, plus one or minus one. If you're using a signum function, you, you use uh, plus one or minus one for a D. If you're using a step function, you'll use plus one or zero for a D. Right, so uh, so you train the weight vector using this first equation. Uh, right, this is first equation, and train the bias using the second equation. So this is how you do it. And uh, so this uh, process is known to converge. So if you take calculate these two quantities, alpha is seven. I mean, this you don't have to know; just it's enough if you know that it converges. So basically, there's a convergence theorem which says that if alpha is defined as this quantity, that is the weight vector uh, dot product with the input uh, data point, right? And take the smallest of all these values for, for all the patterns uh, coming from class C1, such class one. Then take the highest value of the norms of all the uh, data points, the input vectors. So this is alpha, this is beta. Then it is shown that uh, take n max is equal to R, say, the integer version of the, right, the nearest integer of beta times mod w not square mod mod square by alpha so the there's a proof that uh, the perceptron will converge in so many iterations one more thing is the eta which is which defines the step size right, right that is by how much do the weights vary in one iteration that's determined by eta and usually that is taken to be between a value between zero and one and uh, so here the trade-off is if you use a uh, very large eta, then the adaptation, right, the learning could be faster, but can lead to instability. And, but if, and if you use very small eta, then there's no, that it is stable, but it proceeds very slowly. So there's a trade-off, but uh, so eta has to be between zero and one, uh, so, so that it is stable and you can choose a value that is slightly closer to one, so that it is fast enough. Now let us quickly derive the learning rule, uh, what we have just introduced. Right? I'll use a slightly simplified uh, derivation. It's not quite correct uh, because the perceptron learning rule is derived slightly differently. But this is good enough and uh, the reason I'm doing this is we use the same approach even later uh, to derive the learning rule for MLP, the multilayer perceptron. So think of uh, the neuron as this black box which takes the input x and output y and compares it with the, the desired output B. Okay. Uh, so this is a plus and this is minus. So you get the error here. Error is used to update whatever is there inside the box. It could be a single neuron, right? Or it could be a network of a whole layer of neurons. And right? then you call it a perceptron. So Y is equal to G of sigma Let's take a single neuron. You can easily estimate multiple neurons. Now D is, uh, let's say, <clears throat> G is step function. G is plus one if x is in C1 is equal to zero if x is in C2. So this is how D is defined. So what we want is now the total error. It should be minimum. Uh, so D minus Y. Whole square. So the D, you imagine this is there's a subscript for all the patterns, the piece of patterns. So this has to minimize. So so let uh, let us define a small value dp is equal to half of dp minus yp whole square. Right. So therefore the capital E is nothing but sigma. So basically, EP is error per single pattern. 
So you add up all those errors, and you get the total error for the for all the patterns. So the goal is uh, to choose W and B so that this error E is minimized. So how do you do that? We said last yesterday is that we do something called gradient design, right? So you basically uh, so you basically try to change W in the direction of the negative of the gradient. We will take E right with respect to um, W and similarly B with respect to just since B is a scalar. <coughs> so let us work this work this out. Uh, let us differentiate with respect to so let us calculate do E by do so I'll, I'm skipping the subscript P because you know just for simplicity. It is understood that we are calculating the error for a single pattern. So I'll do it for W i. So if I differentiate this expression, right, I get a half times two times. So I'm skipping that P subscript and times minus one. And then you have G prime. Okay, uh, so you differentiate with respect to W i. So you get Xi. Right, so to simplify, B minus Y. Uh, minus so g prime times x. Okay, so if you apply this back into this uh, gradient descent equation and take uh, so delta w is equal to there's a minus sign that comes. So therefore, um, and this is so the it's proportional, or if you want to make it equal, you have to put an eta here, a step size. So is equal to minus eta. So minus and minus get cancelled. So you have d minus y g prime x. So similarly, you can show that uh, do e by do b is equal to half into two into d minus y g prime uh, times. So derivative of this whole thing with respect to b is simply minus one. So there is also another minus one. Uh, so I'm going to put a minus here. So if you take delta b, it is uh, becomes minus theta times d minus y times g prime. Okay, where g prime is evaluated at uh, this whole expression. Well, in fact, I can call this h. And then I can put uh, g prime at h. Okay, this whole argument of g, I will call it h. So this is the this is the learning rules, and so this is for the delta w i and this is for b. The thing is, you can notice that it's not exactly the same as this because there's no g prime expression here. Okay, here also there's no g prime. No, but now we have g prime. So what do we do with this? Okay, so I'm going to do a little hack here. It's not the correct thing to do, but uh, let us live with this for now. Um, So if we take g to be the step function, right? G prime is pretty weird because the derivative of if this is g, g prime will be simply a delta function here, so which is useless because that makes it zero almost everywhere. So nothing changes. So your w i and b are not going to change. But so therefore, what we'll do? We'll take a smoother version of g, the sigmoid function, right? The logistic function which we introduced in one of the previous classes, right? Uh, then if you take a g prime of that, it looks something like this. So now it's not zero everywhere. And uh, in fact, it's, you can show that it's actually positive because logistic function is monotonic. It keeps on increasing. So the derivative is always positive. It goes to zero when you are far from the origin, but at the origin, it, it takes a max value. But it's always positive. So therefore, g prime is like, comes up like a positive factor here. Now, one argument you can present here is uh, since uh, eta is a positive quantity and a small number, and uh, so you can think of g prime also as another kind of eta, just because it's always positive, right? Uh, so you can think of uh, you can define some kind of a new learning grade, eta prime as eta times g of g prime of h, right? So then you can write. Uh, 
delta w is equal to eta prime times d minus y times sorry and delta b is equal to minus eta prime times d minus now if you see this the equations are identical to the previous case only thing is now eta becomes a variable right uh, anyway this is not a correct uh, derivation of this uh, rule there's a different derivation which gives the same result uh, only thing is i want to do it like this because this is exactly how we are going to derive the backdrop learning rule later on okay so this is the perceptron learning rule so we can get rid of this prime and then imagine that eta is a constant okay so uh, so that's uh, what is shown here i'll skip into all this the thing is so there are a lot of nice things about perceptron it's a learning system so in that sense it is like the brain it, it captures one property of the brain which is learnability or trainability all right and uh, one more thing about the perceptron is if you look at the learning equations you have the neuron here and you have the inputs coming to the neuron so these are x1 xi and so on this output y and the connection strength okay, is this is i call it imagine there's something there that's wi now if you want to change wi delta wi you are doing d minus y times xi so if you look at this this connection as a physical connection the output y is available at one end of the connection the one end of the synapse on the post synaptic side so imagine d is also presented to the post synaptic side which is a desired pattern there are some tricky issues here but let's at least computationally you can imagine that d is available here on this side xi is available on the pre synaptic side of this connection so basically to update this synaptic the strength of this synapse which is wi you have to take some information available at post synaptic side and some information available at the pre synaptic side and make a product of them right you get the, all the information that you need to update the strength so in that so th this uh, satisfies what is called the locality principle that is the computations that we describe in all these equations right are uh, obviously occurring over a network of neurons and connections so if you if you assume that there's something going on something happens at a given point in this network either in a neuron or in a connection then the information that you need to perform that computation at that point should be all available locally rather than physically how is it possible i mean if to update this weight if i am using some information somewhere like you know 10 synapses away that's not physically meaning meaningful right I mean, it's not possible so this learning rule is uh, is is a, has a good property from a different point of view which is that it satisfies this locality principle this becomes a big issue later on when we derive the learning rule for the mlp but i just want to point out that uh, perceptron has this property okay so uh, so among many good things so it has it is trainable and it has locality property and it's kind of and it has is made up of neurons and uh, and perceptron can have multiple neurons in fact same learning rule that can applies even when you have multiple neurons we derived it only for a single neuron just for algebraic simplicity but you can also derive it for multiple neurons uh, everything is same except that instead of d minus y you will have di minus y so i thought what is y i and z that z output is di right so therefore in the equations you will have delta w it becomes ij eta times di minus y i times x so that's all so that's only and similarly you have equation for b okay so so these are some of the nice things about perceptron but one major weakness is that it can only classify linearly separable patterns so if this is class 1 and if this is class 2 if they are separable by a straight line or a hyperplane then the perceptron can learn it but if they are not separable by a straight line so if it is something like this right so obviously you cannot separate them so uh, perceptron won't be able to learn this this kind of classes linearly non separable classes so therefore uh, these two guys marvin minsky and seymour papert they have written a book on perceptron and in that uh, they they have, they have established and explored the strengths of the perceptron but they also criticized its weaknesses saying that it is so limited in its capabilities and it is 
not worth studying right the multi layer versions of it so they made a kind of a judgmental comment here when they said that it is not worth studying multi layer versions of perceptron what that means is you can you can see that in the perceptron you just have two layers this is the input layer where the input x is presented this output layer where the output y is taken so there only two layers so you can think of multi networks with multiple layers and right you have many layers each projecting to the next layer and in principle you can construct such networks and these will be called multi layer perceptrons so this guy said it's there's no point studying them because they will also have the same problems which is actually you know counterintuitive because uh, a simple network has limitations like more complex network may not have the limitation that would be more logical to assume but anyway they made that kind of a judgmental statement in this book and because of that it had a very damaging influence on the evolution of the whole neural network uh, theory so this this came in the 60s and in the 70s not much work has happened even the work that was done was did not become popular because it was like all hush hush I and mean, people didn't really want to talk much about it so it is not considered popular then in the 80s you know the generation has changed and things have changed the mindset has changed so people started becoming more open to these ideas so then they started looking at multi layer perceptron and people have figured out how to uh, derive a learning rule for multi layer perceptron which satisfies the same locality principle a multi layer perceptron so in a perceptron you can have either a hard limiting nonlinearity like step function or sigmoid or you can have a smooth sigmoid Uh, uh but in perceptron you always have uh, in a multi layer perceptron you always have smooth nonlinearity like uh, the logistic function right or or tanach so logistic function or tanach <coughs> and it has it can have one or more hidden layers so here the jargon is uh, this input layer where the input is presented then the output layer output can have multiple neurons as always and between the two there is at least one or more hidden layers usually you have one hidden layer that's a basic mlp um yeah so when it is found that uh, you know an mlp doesn't have the kind of problems that uh, perceptron has it can classify data which are not linearly separable so that way it is straight away it is much more much superior to perceptron So you can easily see that in case of a simple problem, like for example, in case of perceptron, we have seen that it cannot learn the XOR problem because XOR problem you have uh, the data points like this. One class is like this, other class is like this. So no matter what you do, you cannot separate these two classes using a straight line. But a perceptron can do it. So let us see that in a moment how you can do it. So uh, if you look at this simple case of a perceptron, of a multi-layer perceptron. So this is the input layer, this is the output layer, and between the two have one hidden layer, and that hidden layer has only two neurons. Okay, so so imagine that they are all McClellan Pitts neurons, and I'll call the output of this neuron V1, this output of this V2, and I define V1 is equal to g of x1 plus x2 minus 0.5, and g is a step function. okay and uh, so this is like the uh, or gate and v2 is g1 plus uh, so g of x1 plus x2 minus 1.5 is like the and gate uh, and then you combine these two outputs uh, to get y which is given as g of v1 minus v2 minus uh, 0.5 so if you do that you can easily show that you get uh, the xor gate how is that because if you take the first one x1 plus x2 minus 0.5 right the separator the decision boundary will be somewhere here right uh, so then if you take x1 plus x second decision boundary of the second one x1 plus x2 minus 1.5 the decision boundary is somewhere here right then if you consider v1 minus v2 right so this so this is uh, one here and zero here this is one here and zero here so if you take uh, this minus this you will end up with something like this so you will end up with this long strip where output is one on both sides output is zero 
Okay, so now that is V1 minus V2, and you subtract 0.5 from that. So then, if you subtract, uh, so V1, if you take V1 minus V2 minus 0.5, this whole region will be 0.5, and the region outside that zero becomes minus 0.5, and here also you have minus 0.5. So now, you, if you pass this through a step function, this part will become one and it will go to one, and this part will go to zero. So you get the desired answer. So that is the XOR gate. So we can show that uh, if you that you can express the XOR computation in a network structure, which is an MLP, which has a single hidden layer, and that hidden layer has only two neurons. Okay, so straight away it's a proof of concept that an MLP is more powerful than a perceptron. Okay, but that's only an example, so you cannot argue too much with examples. So we need to show two things now to really convince ourselves that MLP is really fundamentally more powerful than a perceptron. So for that, we need two things. That uh, we should be able to show that MLP can learn a much larger class of problems than a perceptron. Because perceptron can only learn linearly separable classes, but we should show that MLP does more than that. Secondly, we need a learning rule. The perceptron learning rule was, was very easy to derive. We could do it in one minute. But MLP derivation will be slightly more tricky. Right? Uh, so first of all, let us look at this. People have shown, uh, some annotations have shown these approximation theorems, right, uh, which uh, reveal the power of MLPs. So for example, it's been proven that MLP can approximate any continuous multivariate function to any degree of accuracy, provided there are sufficiently many hidden neurons. Okay, so, so so therefore MLP is called a universal approximator, right? And more formally, MLP with a single hidden layer can approximate any continuous input-output function with arbitrary accuracy over a finite input domain that given number, enough number of nodes or neurons in the hidden layer. Now, so all that you need is a finite input domain, which is okay, right? Because usually in any practical problem, You'll be only looking at a finite input domain. You don't want to model it from minus infinity to plus, to plus infinity, right? So if your uh, data is defined over a finite domain, and if your input output function that you're trying to learn uh, is continuous, that's all that it needs. Both of them are very reasonable uh, assumptions or requirements. Then the theorem says that you can learn such a function with arbitrary accuracy, whatever accuracy you want, given, a, given enough number of neurons in the hidden layer. So actually, this kind of a thing, uh, although it seems a bit new in uh, in neural network context, actually we have all done this uh, in different contexts in basic mathematics. If you look at your first year math mathematics, let's take the example of Taylor series, right? So any f of x uh, or x naught plus h, right? I can expand f of x around x naught, right, with a small increment h. Right, in terms of uh, uh, so f of x naught plus h into f of f prime at x naught and so on so on. So you get a power series in terms of h, right? So suppose you are computing one such function in a in a computer program. So so ideally Taylor series has infinite terms. Obviously you cannot calculate infinite terms. So you truncate the series somewhere and say this is good enough for me. So so how many terms do you take? How do you decide that? So that depends on the error that you desire, right? So if you want less error, you have to have more terms in this uh, in this summation, right? So similarly, so that is one example. Let's take another example is Fourier series. Okay, any periodic function, right? X, uh, let's say S of T. E. Uh, so where s of t is equal to s of t plus capital T, right? This is true for all t at all times. It's a periodic function. So we know that that can be expressed as uh, some value, a constant value a0 plus sigma uh, cn times cos of n omega naught t plus um, five. So this is one way to show it. N goes from one to infinity. OK, so, uh, so what we are doing here is we are expressing an unknown function, s of t, 
right as a linear sum of a family of functions the family of functions are the cosines and cosines is basic cosine with the fundamental and all its harmonics right even the cosines they are not random cosines they are all fundamental and its harmonics okay and here also what we are doing is we are expressing the here h is a variable where x not is a constant we are expressing this function of h as a polynomial in h okay of some finite degree because we are we want it only up to certain error level so we'll truncate it somewhere so here also when you calculate fourier series in practical situations you'll truncate it somewhere uh, you don't go all the way to infinity you'll truncate it depending upon how much error uh, you want or how much accuracy you want so one more example you can give like this is uh, what is called the sampling theorem uh, in communications so what it says is uh, so there is something called a sync function so what it says is if i have a signal which is band limited okay so it's uh, so signal this is the spectrum of the signal this is the band right and so then that means if you sample the signal at a rate of so sampling rate should be greater than 2 times b then you can reconstruct the signal perfectly okay so this ah uh, so so how how do you do that so there's something called a sync function which is it goes on for you know lots of so which is basically sin x by x um so you so you basically you can so you can think i'll call this just phi of x function phi of x so how do you reconstruct this you express your unknown signal or uh, phi of uh as a linear sum of phi i of x so basically take shifted versions of this sync functions right and and give them different weightages different values right and then take linear sum of them that will give you the original signal so what we are doing in all these cases is we are trying to approximate an unknown signal we call this x of p as a linear sum of a family of functions phi i of p because okay, there should be something common to all these functions that is uh, the function should be the same in form but only different in terms of the value of some parameter for example here in this case in case of the cosine they are all cosines the only difference is uh the n value and the phi n value are different okay but it is the same cosine function so that way it's a family of functions so there are many such results in mathematics or in a branch of mathematics for uh approximation theory now what is happening in case of mlp is something very similar right uh, So in case of MLP, imagine an MLP which has a single output and a hidden layer and an input layer. Okay, I'm not drawing all the connections to keep the picture simple. So this is output Y. So Y now can be written as uh, I can. So thing is, uh, the hidden neurons all have the sigmoid function G. the output neuron may or may not have it's not important right to have a sigmoid function because there is a mathematical uh, uh, conveniences or some you can you don't you don't need the sigmoid here so why can be written as sigma w i g of uh, so this is w i wait here is w i g of sigma w i j times x j minus b i so b i is a threshold term here uh, so input is x j at the jth neuron right so this is the expression for uh, this thing now you can also write in slightly more compact form as sigma i w i g of uh, w wi will be a vector wij is a scalar so i'll call it wi 
dot product, right, with x vector minus b. This is something more compact. So what are we doing here? It is very similar in form to this equation. So we are trying to come up with a function, right, which is a mapping from x to y. So x is a vector, and y is a real number scalar. Okay. So this this expression maps input vector x onto y. Uh, how does it do that? It simply <coughs> models the unknown function as a linear sum of a family of functions. The family of functions is nothing but the sigmoids, right? And the sigmoids are parameterized by wi's, right? Uh, vector wi and uh, the scalar bi. So you are, all that you are doing is you are taking many sigmoids where these parameters are different, and so that gives you a family of functions, and take a linear sum of such functions, and so that gives you the unknown function. Which the network is trying to model, and that is very similar to what we have done in case of Fourier series or Taylor series, right? Sampling theorem. It's it's all the same. So th these are all uh, very general class of results, uh, which come from approximation theory, where you try to express a known function as a linear sum of certain known functions, a family of functions. So people have shown that this form is a very mathematically a very powerful expression. And uh, given certain simple, very mild conditions on, because we keep saying sigmoid, so there's some mild conditions on G, and with those conditions, a network like this can learn any continuous function over a finite domain, provided the number of neurons here in the hidden layer is large enough, right? If you want more accuracy, you have more neurons in the hidden layer. So the hidden layer neurons is is behaving like the number of terms in this expansion. So this is, that's basically what it is here. Okay, so that is the first thing. And then uh, if you look at the second uh, uh, issue, which is uh, so we, how do we train this? Right here also again we follow the same principle. So you think of uh, the whole MLP sitting inside this box. I give the input vector x as input and get the output vector y. Then compare that with the target output vector t, or you know you can use the notation b. And compare that with this, and give the error to the network. And that error will change all the weights inside the network in such a way that next time around, when you give an x, the y that you will get will be slightly closer to the d that you give as input. So that way, it's actually uh, this is so this is called a new network approach to problem solving because by this method, if you want to solve a problem. Right. If you, if you look at a traditional approach to solve the problem, you have to analyze the problem, write down underlying equations, and figure out a series of steps to solve the problem. So that's a traditional or algorithmic approach. But whereas uh, in unit work approach, you know, it just learns from experience. So take for example the problem of recognizing say letters. Right. So if you want to understand that this is letter A and this is letter B, then if you want to develop an algorithm. I might find out. Okay, if you want to find letter E, I'll look for a line which is which has a positive slope, and look for another line which has a negative slope, and another line which has zero slope, and see if they are connected, forming T junctions, and you know, and so on and so forth. And if I if all this is true, then it is letter E. Okay, so that's how you would do an algorithmic develop an algorithmic approach uh, to solve this problem. But if you give the same problem to a neural network, it just takes lots of examples of letter E. And so on, so for lots of examples of letter B, and it just learns to map this from examples. You don't have to do all this, you know, scud work, right? It just learns from experience. That is very similar to how even people learn, how humans learn. So people have developed an algorithm for uh, for training the MLP also, just like we have developed. Uh, we have derived the learning rule for perceptrons, and many people have uh, discovered this algorithm at different times. So, for example, in the 70s, Paul Verbos did his PhD thesis at MIT, where he described this algorithm. But it was not uh, given much attention because, like I was saying, after the damaging book on perceptrons in the 60s by Minsky and Papert, uh, people started you know, neglecting this whole field, All right? And uh, so, therefore, nobody paid much attention to Verbos, Paul Verbos' thesis. 
then in the 80s sir malhart maclaren and williams have discovered this and brought about it so 86 there was a paper by these guys then parker and, you know wrote about same thing in 85 and likun also wrote a paper in the same in the same time right about the same thing okay so kind of many people have discovered it and assume that they have discovered it independently that all about the same time now in backprop in uh, in this mlp uh, learning rule that we use something called a backprop creation uh, learning rule so where if this is your mlp the input is given here then the input is then passed on to hidden layer you get the hidden layer output and the hidden layer output is passed on to the output layer you get the output layer output which is y then compare this y with other desired output t uh, d or you know target output t just two notations get the error it's called delta then we back propagate this delta to the hidden layers and calculate some kind of equivalent delta at all the hidden layers once you have that you can update each weight right anywhere that you have w or j in right so you have delta at the upper side of the connection and some kind of state of the neuron which is vj at the on the lower end of the connection so the update for the connection will be simply the product uh, of the delta at the postsynaptic side and the vj at the presynaptic side okay so let us uh, derive this quickly i think we have enough time <coughs> uh so you, this is your network Oops. Oh, sir. So output is Y I. In the hidden layer output, I'll call this V J, and input is X K, and these weights are W J K, and these are this is the first stage. This whole thing is first. stage weights and the weights from here to here is second stage weights and uh, so these weights uh, are called w i j second stage weights right now the output y is given as the sigmoid function g of so the output is y i i define the total input going into the neuron here as hi where hi is defined as sigma w ij s times vj i am neglecting the bias term for for now and there is a very easy way to just add the bias term later i'll i'll explain that later okay uh, then vj is given again as sigma of uh so hi is second stage here so hj of first stage then hj of f is given as sigma w jk first stage xk uh summation over k okay so this is this defines the input output relationship so given x here how do you propagate it to the hidden layer and find vjs and given vj how do you propagate it over this stage of weights and find the outputs okay so now how do you train this so training like before we define the total output error as simply a sum of all the uh, okay errors of single patterns and call this gp okay and ep um we define as half of uh, sigma d i minus y i whole square so see that uh, output index is y uh, i so i'm not uh, showing the uh, pattern index p here just for simplicity okay so basically it's assume that uh, if this is being calculated for the pth pattern so this output is for one pattern so now the, the training is nothing but finding delta w i j of s how much is this and simply delta w delta w j k of 
F. How much is this? This is what is meant by finding training algorithm. So what we do is uh, the approach is always the same, right? Just do gradient descent is equal to minus eta times do e p by do w i g of s. The approach is always the same, so you just have to differentiate this. Let us do that. So you get again half times two times uh, d i minus y i, because when you differentiate the error here with respect to a connection, so there is one error term at each of these output neurons, e one, e two, e three, and so on. Okay, so this, so I'll call this sorry, I'll call this uh, e. Uh, EP, EP, so this is correct, this is EP. Okay, so EP has uh, some N terms or N output, number of output neurons, so many terms. Now, we are differentiating this whole thing with respect to one of these connections. And only this connection will influence error at only one of the output neurons, the ith neuron, right? So therefore, uh, the summation will disappear. You have only one term here. So times, again, minus one. This y is the one which depends on this weight. So minus one times again g prime of uh, h i of s. Now h i of s, you have differentiated with respect to w i j of s, okay, which gives you v j. So this is fairly straightforward. <coughs> so if you now add this minus, minus and sign and all that, So you get <clears> theta <throat> times di minus yi times g prime at hi of s times vj. So this is pretty straightforward. And this is also pretty convenient and elegant in the sense it has the locality property. Because if I take a connection going from output neuron to the hidden neuron, so this i output neuron, this is a jth hidden neuron. And to update this connection, I'm saying I need di minus yi, which is available at this neuron. I need hi of s, which is available also at this neuron. I need vj, which is available here. So whatever I need to update this connection is available on both sides of the connection. So it is satisfying the locality principle. OK, so which is good. Now, things are not so simple to calculate when you calculate the second derivative of this this term right that is do ep by do w f j k so i think we're running out of time let us uh, do that in the next class because there the you, the form that you immediately get will be a very cumbersome form right we need to make some assumptions and you know rework those expressions in a different form so that it satisfies the locality principle so that will take some time. So let us do it in next class. So next class.